It's the best time of the day. Yes, the GB News Tavern is open. It's time for Talking Pints. I'm going to be joined tonight by Mark Ward, former Premier League footballer who played at Man City, Everton and West Ham. Here he is playing in the Merseyside derby when Everton beat Liverpool 2-0 in 1993. Hinchcliffe could really veer the ball in with his left foot. Does it with pace and swerve. But McManaman only to Mark Ward. It wasn't really what he would have wanted, but McManaman just flapped at that and only succeeded in setting it up for Ward, who hit it hard and true past a furious grubble up. Well, I've got to say, Mark, well, what a goal! Fantastic. And I'm guessing in a Merseyside derby, that's got to be a bit special, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, it was, you know, for a scouser to score in the derby. Uh, it's a dream, it was a dream come true, you know. Yeah. And uh, a guest of yours recently, Tony Cott, who scored the second goal and we went on to win the game. It was a fantastic performance on the day. It was. Your story is interesting, isn't it? Because those that don't know football and they're looking today at the Premier League and they're seeing these young guys earning extraordinary sums of money. And it's like you'd imagine they're picked out as teenage talent and they're straight in and life's really easy. But for you, as a young lad that wanted to play football, it wasn't quite like that. You had to really fight your way up, didn't you? I did, yeah. You know, I, I was at Everton as a young kid and then they signed me an apprentice at 16. I'd be on £16 a week, cleaning the boots, the toilets, the terraces, which they, they don't do anymore. And I uh, was let go at 18. Uh, and, that, and that was Everton, yeah? That was Everton, yeah. And, you know, eventually they bought me back for a million pounds. <laughs> but it was a big journey to go but back. Being let go at 18... Been your dream. I mean, mean, there's an awful lot of young people go through this heartbreak, aren't there? Yeah, and they're a lot younger now. You know, kids are there from a a very young age. So when they're told that they're not good enough at six, seven, eight years of age... Really? Yeah, that's what happens. And, uh, you know, at 18, I remember crying in my dad's arms when he got home. And uh, he said, stick at it, son, you've got all the ability in the world. He said, you'll get stronger, you're only small... And that was one of the reasons why they let me go. It was being, being smallish guy yeah. a smallish guy a disadvantage? Oh, obviously, yeah, yeah. But I got a lot stronger. With the strength, I got quicker. And I've always said this. I went and played non-league, a team called Northwich Victoria, and playing with proper men. Uh, so the two years playing in the conference as such, that made me the player I was. Was it, was it tough? It was tough, yeah. But it was, what, physically yeah, tough? Very, you know, you're playing with... <laughs> I think the next youngest in the team was 28, so it's not like the academies now, you're playing against your own age group. You know, you're playing yeah. against proper, solid performers. You know what I mean? So it helped me out a lot. But in the end, you work your way back. Yeah. And you're playing, you know, you, well, you played for some great clubs, didn't you? Yeah, the Amers. Uh, fantastic club. 80, 85, 86 season, we finished third, played in every game. Should have, should have won the league, really. Uh, the highest they've ever finished. Yeah. Uh, Liverpool won it, Everton was second, and we pushed the two Merseyside teams right to the right to the wire, really. And uh, I'm proud of being a part of that team. It was a fantastic team. When you think two two players scored 58 goals between them, McAvenny and Cotty. Yeah, Cotty, you know, yeah. It doesn't happen now. Uh, so, you know, it's a terrific football team. And then I went to City. Uh, Man City. Yeah, went to City with Howard Kendall. Uh, and then that was only there 18 months, and then signed for the club. It will love. So Everton. the club that got rid of you yeah. pays a million to get you back. Exactly. <laughs> but it happens in football. Yeah. <laughs> but that must have felt quite sweet. It was, you know, and uh, I remember scoring two goals on my home debut. And uh, when you think I've been there since I was a baby, and then you, you're playing against the champions, Arsenal, and they scored two, uh, a terrific goal from 25 yards past David Seaman. And uh, I think my dad who died a year before he, I think he was there in spirit that night and blew two goals in for me it was a fantastic feeling So Everton's deep within you oh, I yeah, guess without a doubt yeah and they're struggling as well I'm going to say there's a slight problem with the owner isn't there a Russian owner what? yes because I mean, I mean Chelsea's, Chelsea's up for sale yeah so what's happening with Everton well it's, it's plain and clear that they haven't invested in the right players you know mm. the recruitment has been awful uh, and it's like any business, whoever you bring in, if they're not good at their job or they're not up for it, your business is going to suffer. And, you know, the recruitment has been absolutely dreadful. And, uh, you know, last night they were lucky to draw, uh, barely play tonight. 
And they've still they've got a lot of hard games coming to the end of the season. And they're sort of two thirds of the way down the table. Well, they're just above, up, just above the. Uh, yeah, so it's one of them. Uh, they say Everton don't go down because we've got the longest, you know, history of being at the top level. But it does happen to big clubs. So it's a really crucial few weeks. It is, yeah. And it's on the other hand with West Ham. You know, they're going for European glory, and yeah. uh, you know they've had a fantastic season. And David Moyes has come to the fore now. He started. You know, they've given the job at the start of the season, uh, two seasons ago, and he's just put a great squad together. And I feel sorry for him because he hasn't got a big squad, but what he's done, he's put a good team together and they've been very consistent. And I think they can go all the way in this Europa League. Interesting. Tell you the football story that really touched me this week. And it wasn't Crystal Palace losing. But the, <laughs> I'm a bit sad about yeah. that. <laughs> but the football story that touched me this week was Wayne Rooney. Yeah. You know, Rooney, a megastar, scored a lot of goals for England, went across to America, was immensely popular. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was over in Washington, D.C., people were talking about Rooney, yeah. immensely popular. Gets into management, there he is with Derby, managing Derby County, all sorts of problems, yeah. penalties, they've gone right down the leagues as a result of these penalties. And Rooney presumably could go off and get a big job somewhere. Mm. And yet he said he's going to stick with them. Well, that's, to me, that's uh, susses him out as a person. Yeah, you know? I agree. Because he, he took a job that's really difficult. And he's going to learn, you know, these, these couple of seasons he's going to have at Derby. And, uh, like, some, some players get the best job straight away. But, you know, he's learning his trade at a very difficult time and done a fantastic job. And I've seen the clip where he was talking to the supporters saying, yeah, I'm not leaving you and we're going to get go. I thought it was terrific. Yeah. For a guy that's been a megastar to accept where he is and say, no, we're going to fight back and do this yeah. was brilliant. Is football in healthy shape overall? Well, financially, it would be great to play now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd rather have played when I played because I'd like to tackle and uh, there were some great characters in the game. But you earn good money. Yeah, decent money, but I was a spender, Nigel, and I think that's what happened to me. You know, I didn't, I didn't uh, plan for life after football, and a lot of players didn't. Uh, you know, and we weren't on fantastic money like they are now, but uh, it but was good, good money. Yeah, good money, and uh, you know that was the reason why I got into trouble. You know. So what happens, Mark? It, it ends. The, the the career comes to an end, as inevitably it does. Yeah. And what you start to find you're running out of money. Yeah, because it's, you know, I finished when I was 35, 36, went back into the non-league as a player manager at Alton. And 35, 36 actually is quite a good age at top flight football, isn't it? Of course it is, yeah, yeah. And now the pitches are perfect, so the injuries aren't as much as I don't think is in our day. Mm. They they do say the game's quicker, I'll I'll argue that, but at the end of the day, if if you don't prepare for life after football, if you're not involved coaching or management or in the media... It's a massive void that's gone from you because you have to be disciplined to play at the top level. You have to, you know, make yeah. sure you go to bed early overnight nights because you've got to be able to perform on a Saturday. So what happens to Mark Ward then? Well, in a nutshell, I, I made the decision that I'll always regret and, uh, you know, I chose to rent a property out for certain individuals and uh, they used that for stashing drugs. Uh, never lived there, but I was I was caught up in a in a big operation with proper you know, villains, really, and uh, I always held, uh, held my hands up, uh, pleaded guilty at the first opportunity, uh, couldn't really say who I rented the property to uh, because I wanted to, when I got out of prison, to be, you know, not looking over my shoulder and protecting people. So these are bad guys, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was an operation on them called Operation Vatican, and, you know, drug dealers need places to store the drugs and... I made a decision, I'd just come back from Australia, my visa had gone out and I wanted to go back uh, and I made a decision to, to do that six months and uh, I was caught up in it all and I got 12 years really. And because uh, I pleaded guilty, uh, they gave me eight and I'd done four. What was it like going to prison? It was tough, yeah. The, the Liverpool prison was very tough, very brutal, very violent. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody no. you know which it's, it's a very very uh, brutal atmosphere in there and uh, you've got to be able to look after yourself and I just you know I realised I'd done something really wrong you know let me myself down my family and everybody else that knew me and uh, what I did do I'd done my time as, as well as I could done all the courses got out there as soon as I could and uh, you know for the last two years I was in an open prison and I worked outside so in the community and was it tougher on you being a known person 
everybody knew me, so I think when you're in prison, you're just well, a number. In then. Liverpool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're just a number, and I'll always remember that num- number to the day I die. And uh, so I was NM6982, but everyone knew me because I was the Premier League footballer, yeah. but you don't know who the guy next to you is in the cell or whatever. So in some aspects, it was, it was, uh, it was easier for me. And how have you managed to pull your life back together again after that? Well, I just said to you, I was with a, a, a person who's been on this show, Thomas Skinner, me and Tom. Yeah. We played golf a few years back and we we're just gone into a coffee Great business. Guy. Yeah. Bosch Coffee. Yep. You know, he might be this might be Bosch Lager. So he's, <laughs> he's, he's just a great guy, he's over in Ireland. He was world. wonderful when he came yeah, on. And he, you know what? He's been on The Apprentice and he's been on Master Chef and you know, he'll probably be in the jungle at Christmas, I don't know. But he's a great guy to work for and we're just trying to push our coffee all, all around the country. So you're falling in with the right guy now? The right guy who works tirelessly, you know, I've never known anyone works so, as much as him and uh, we live close to each other and uh, we're doing really well. So what, Mark, looking back on it all, you had to fight damned hard yeah. to get to become a Premier League footballer. Uh, you got there, you had a successful career, some great moments. You suffer, you know, I guess, public humiliation in the end by going to prison. What's the moral of a story for young footballers out there today? To plan after uh, your career is over. Now, if you're at the top level, you know you learn a lot of money these days. And but you still uh, blow it, can't you? Of course you can. Yeah. No, it's like anything. You know, I think gambling's still a big problem in football. Uh, it yeah. wasn't my day. And it's, if you were you gambling, uh, everyone did in the dressing room. Maybe a bar about two. We always had a bet. We had a bookie in the in the dressing room. Alan Devonshire was our bookie. <laughs> it was just a footballer's disease. I shouldn't laugh, really. No, no. It was a footballer's disease, Nigel. It was. Yeah. And, uh, but now, because of the, the apps and everything else, we used to have to go to bookies to put the bets on. Now it's now. even easier, isn't it? Well, it's easy, yeah. yeah. And it's like in proportion to what you're earning. So, you know, I think that's one of the main concerns about me in the, the football with the youngsters, really. Planning for afterwards, putting some money aside, yeah. being sensible. Putting your pension. All the things that young people aren't very good at doing in many, exactly, many ways. Yeah. But it's an important lesson. Mark Ward, thank you for telling your story Thanks, and joining me on Cheers. Talking Pints. Thank, thank you. you very much.